Aris Kokolyev and his wife Kaleria are artists from the village of Palekh in Russia. Before the revolution, Palekh was known for icon painting. During Soviet times, the painters turned to fairy tale characters. And on April the 12th, 1961, one fairy tale miraculously came true. Well, imagine the first human to travel into space. It's such a breakthrough going there. It's huge. The excitement was immeasurable. The artists knew intuitively that a new hero had emerged, worthy of being immortalized by the latest of many generations of painters. The hero who descended from the sky was a simple carpenter's son, Yuri Gagarin. Icon painting paved the way for the future development of the art in Palak. And so we couldn't break with the convention and creative characteristics of our art. This comes from the heart, you know. I've never even seen him in person. For me, this is the image of a hero. If Yuri Gagarin had known that the artists in Palak were creating a series of paintings depicting him with almost biblical illustrations, it's highly likely he would not have approved. The first human flight into space was seen as a triumph of science. Gagarin himself often said that spaceflight was no miracle, but a direct result of hard work by thousands of people, researchers, engineers, and developers. He was simply lucky to have been chosen from 12 other worthy candidates. In his own story, though, there is no shortage of miracles, prophecies, and eureka moments. He was being awarded some accolade. There was a reception being held for the occasion. And suddenly he says, ladies and gentlemen, at that time in the 60s, we didn't have gentlemen, and we didn't have ladies. We just had citizens, or at the most, we had men and women. And anyway, I know where he comes from. I know the village of Klushina. I know that place. He was born to an ordinary family in a small house in a remote village. Yuri Gagarin was born in 1934, and in 1935, Konstantin Tselkovsky, an early pioneer of spaceflight theory, wrote, I can easily imagine who will be the first human to overcome gravity. He's Russian. He's a citizen of the Soviet Union, most probably a pilot by profession. I can imagine his honest Russian face, his sharp blue eyes. That's what Tsiolkovsky published in 1935. Interestingly, he published it when Yuri Gagarin was just one year old. And when Yuri was just seven years old, war broke out. The Soviet army was retreating and the Nazis entered the village of Klushina without striking a blow. Civilians were forced out of their homes. The Gagarin family had to live in a field dugout for two years. The Germans' field kitchen was close to them in the courtyard. When the Germans had finished serving the soldiers and everything was quiet, we used to go to the dump where they threw away their waste. We'd look through their rubbish to find a slice of sausage or a chunk of bread that they'd thrown away. According to Yevgeny Derbenkov, the villagers were terrified of aeroplanes. And Yuri Gagarin, the friend who shared his hungry childhood, never even dreamed of flying. 
One day, though, curiosity proved stronger than fear. He runs up to me and says, Evgeny, let's go. A plane's landed in the bushes. It had come down in bog land, broken. I get there and Yuri's already inside. I'll never forget what he said. What took you so long? I'm already flying. That was long before his first real flight. In 1945, after war ended, the family left their village for the town of Gzhatsk, a small town in the Smolensk region that's known today as Gagarin. When in 1946 or 47, Yuri and his brother were going home from school, they encountered wolves in the central square. There's a statue of Gagarin there now. So can you imagine how devastated these lands must have been for wolves to come into town? Young boys who lived through the war feared neither wolves nor death. The 12-year-old Yuri Gagarin's favorite game was an unusual variety of dare. He'd take a grenade and he'd pull the pin. It would blow up after 10 seconds and he'd count one, two, three, four, five, six, and then throw it straight up. It would go off in the air like thunder and lightning. Girls liked him. They liked him a lot. They chased after him trying to find the right approach. He was handsome, athletic, a boxer and played the trumpet. He was the first trumpet player in the orchestra. I used to go to his house and cry, give me the trumpet, please, I want to try. Eventually I did get one and became the second trumpet player. With all that going for him, why did model student Yuri Gagarin suddenly drop out of school at 15, leave home and join a trade school? It may seem hard to understand today, but those who remember the post-war years consider this strange decision quite reasonable. How could we just sponge off our parents? We lived very modestly. One could even say poorly. That's why there were so many people who studied so they could start working. There was no use for reading books or scribbled writing. Foundry work wasn't really Gagarin's chosen occupation. It was the only trade available to teenagers with just six years of school behind them. At first, Yuri envied the turners and locksmiths, but eventually he became accustomed to blazing heat and molten metal. So much so that 10 years later, as his rocket caught fire while re-entering Earth's atmosphere, Gagarin would calmly say to his colleagues, I'm burning up. Goodbye, comrades. He never talked about whether the experience was frightening or not. He just said that when he had been descending and had seen fire through the porthole, it had been a bit scary. I'm burning up now. This is the end, he thought. Of course, the world's first cosmonaut didn't burn up and didn't even go mad as psychiatrists had feared. Strangely though, after that iconic orbital flight, he landed on the site where he had taken off for the very first time. And he says, I know this place. I used to fly here. It's the Sarata Flying Club. He had studied there. He knew all these fields. It's thought that Gagarin joined the Flying Club while still a third-year student at the Industrial Technical School for no better reason than because being a pilot at the time was seen as cool. Obviously, we were eager to demonstrate that we would start a career in aviation in no time. Then Yuri suggests that we go to a military shop to buy pilot's caps. We went to a dance party, and he had a pretty girl called Ina. She liked him, and he was totally in love with her. Her parents found out about it. They lived in a posh house here. Her father was on the regional party's committee, and he said to her, Ina, you see, yes, Yuri Gagarin is an A student, but when he graduates from technical school, what are his prospects? He could well become a foreman, but nothing more senior. Despite the smile in every photograph from that time, his friends knew that not everything was going well for Yuri. The girl he loved split up with him, and his aviation career wasn't taking off. 
They were actually going to kick him out because he was bad at it. He constantly failed to land properly. He couldn't see the ground and didn't know how to land a plane gently without plopping down and breaking the landing gear. They had to give him a number of additional flights and then qualification flights. According to Gagarin's official biography, after his very first flight, Yuri knew that he would become not just a pilot, but a military pilot. He would dart through the clouds in a jet fighter. The reality, though, is a little different. The future cosmonaut's fate was, in fact, decided by anonymous officials from the Ministry of Education. Yuri and I were going to enroll at the Moscow Institute of Steel and Alloys after finishing technical school. Back then, there was a system. 5% of graduates with the distinction could enter university without exams. Well, we wanted to get into university, but the country needed craftsmen, and there were just 15 people in our group. So we were scattered all over the Soviet Union. Yuri had to go to Tomsk, I had to go to Stalin, and so on. We weren't allowed to be in that 5%. That was a turning point. To work with a hot furnace in a Siberian factory, or join the army and fly airplanes through clear blue skies, the choice was obvious. Gagarin graduated from the Saratov Flying Club with distinction and was admitted to the Orenburg Air Force Pilot School without exams. He was made a deputy platoon commander. He liked order very much. He liked everything to be just so. Once in winter, everybody was taken outside for morning exercises. I'm not going, Yuri. I don't feel like it, I say. He replied toughly, no, you will go. I can see that you're pretending. If you don't go, you'll be washing the floors in the barracks. I mean, he wouldn't accept any favoritism. The Gagarin smile. It's hard to imagine that the first ever cosmonaut could be strict. It's even harder to believe that there were people who hated him. Nevertheless, four years prior to the flight, his fellow students at the pilot school thought he needed a lesson. The guys there like to go absent without leave. And he, being deputy commander, started warning them. Guys, if you go AWOL again, I'll inform the administration. They didn't like that, and they gave him a blanket party. They flung a big sack over his head and started throwing punches. Three of the trainees who'd assaulted Gagarin were expelled, but he later confessed to his friends that he had deserved the treatment. He said, Victor, you know I was young, and I shouldn't have raised the issue with the guys. I should have just pretended not to notice, but you know, I just couldn't do it that way. This footage was taken in 1962 in Japan, a year after the landing. By then, Gagarin had no enemies. The whole planet seemed to adore him and millions of women were jealous of one modest and bespectacled brunette, his wife, Valentina. But why her? Many people wanted to know how she had captured the handsome hero's heart. The answer is simple. When they first met on a dance floor in Orenburg, Valentina rejected the attentions of trainee pilot Gagarin. She was the one who didn't fall for him. Gagarin, though, refused to give up. The more difficult and inaccessible the goal, the more driven and motivated he was to achieve it. Well, she was a pretty and slim girl. He met her on the same day that I met her. I liked her a lot too, Valentina. I wanted to swipe her away from him, but I failed. He basically met her, got attached to her, and he never let her go after that.
Valentina married a pilot, but Gagarin only ever worked as a pilot for two years. When he was offered the chance of a medical examination which would qualify him to start training for space flight, Gagarin didn't hesitate. He was inevitably attracted to the idea. The more inaccessible the goal, the more driven and motivated he became. The most difficult part was the endurance test in a hyperbaric chamber at an altitude of 14,000 meters with just an oxygen mask. On that test, people often suffered nitrogen boiling in their blood. Things like that are unnecessary and often sift out a lot of talented guys and harm their health. That's why we were outraged. That outrage, by the way, was initiated by Yuri. And I remember when the head doctor found out about it, he spoke to Gagarin and warned him, I'll expel you. There was this fellow, Dr. Yazdowski, who said, you know the difference between you and the dogs? They're silent, and all you do is bark. In the history of space exploration, there were two famous dogs that survived and returned to Earth alive. Their names are legendary, Belka and Strelka. But there was also Laika, sent into orbit in a satellite capsule with no chance of survival. There were Lisichka and Chaika, who died after their rocket exploded on the launch pad. Every member of the first group of cosmonauts was aware that the same could happen to them. Their chances of survival were slim. But in spite of the risk, everyone wanted to be the first. And the final decision rested largely with chief spacecraft designer Sergei Korolev. It was October 1960 when we first met Mr. Korolev. He spoke to Gagarin first and asked where he lived, where he served, and about his family. Then he went through the rest from A to Z. There was Anikiev, Bukovsky, Valinov. So at that very moment after we left, I said, he's the first candidate. We all thought that he was a test pilot. But on April 12, when we found out that he was in fact in cosmonaut training, it was like a thunderbolt. We had never even suspected it. I came out to Revolution Square and barely recognized Moscow. Crowds of people were crying, hugging each other and laughing. I asked, what's happened? Are you from another planet? It's Gagarin. Gagarin went into space. After all, a human had descended from heaven, not from a height of 22 to 24 kilometers. People had already gone that high, but from there, from the gods. And obviously everyone wondered if he had actually seen God. Gagarin didn't see God, but he was almost treated as a god. He was fascinated by the stars, and he became a superstar that everybody wanted to meet, from the Queen of England to a former roommate. Here and there, people were saying, he's great, great, really great, mighty. He went where nobody had ever been before. I wanted to ask him a few questions, wanted to have a chat and understand who he was. He might be an alien now. Meanwhile, Gagarin had a message that he wanted to send out to mankind. When he landed, he said that Earth was a wonderful place, and everyone who lives on this planet must unite. All together. And I emphasize that. Unite. Come together to take care of it. The message was for mankind, 
but it was heard by ordinary people whose priorities were more down to earth. They asked for an autograph, a smile, or for help to feed livestock. My cattle needed a bit of support. I had nothing to feed them. I said, what about some feed? Can you request that from the government? And he could get it. I used to get hold of bicycles and, excuse me for saying this, toilets for building sites, because the city had been neglected. He arranged proper drainage for the city. All the streets were dug up. Everyone had plenty of questions for him. I mean, we constantly had visitors. When he came over, our house was always full of guests. Some needed help with rent, others needed assistance getting into hospital. He could come here and barely manage to talk to anybody. When he got a call from Moscow, he immediately went back there. After the flight, he belonged neither to himself nor to his family. I mean, not his wife and kids, and not us. In this rare footage, the cosmonaut is seen with his wife and two daughters. It seems the very image of a peaceful and harmonious life, but they're not alone. A documentary crew is filming for a historical record. He didn't need it. The country did. He was a sort of symbol. They'd bring him along to meet this person, to go there or somewhere else. He was exhausted. That's what he said. He liked to live it up, you know. When he visited his parents in Gajatsk, he drove a Renault. He raced in this car like crazy. I went with him once and never did it again. He needed to reduce his stress because he had so much responsibility and maybe the kind of pressure that can make you go crazy. He was only indignant and maybe dissatisfied because he wasn't allowed to fly. They basically put limits on him and he always asked to take a flight. Can I fly a MiG-15? Anything. I just want to fly all the time. Yes, he used to say, they won't let me fly, they're protecting me. On the 27th of March, 1968, on a routine training flight in a regular fighter jet, along with Vladimir Siryogin, an experienced flight instructor, Yuri Gagarin, the world's first ever cosmonaut, despite those attempts to protect him, died. And you start to think, but why Gagarin? What's the reason? Because there were others there. At that time, I was parachute jumping there too. Why has something not happened to us, but happened to him, of all people? What a ridiculous turn of events. That was wrong. It was wrong. They made a mistake there, particularly against Gagarin. Not long before that fatal day, 33-year-old Yuri Gagarin said, it seems that I will never die. He was signing his gypsum copy of a statue created by sculptor Grigory Posnikov. When at the funeral he says to me, lucky Yuri, I say, what do you mean, Grigory? He will remain in people's minds like Jesus Christ who died at the same age. And so, he will be forever young. That's what Posnikov said. And I answered, you know, it would be right if he had lived to the age of Moses. That would be right.
He died, but for us he is still alive. We have depicted him not on a spaceship, but on a Russian troika. He's driving this troika. We were inspired by the song of the falcon. There is a line that goes, you died, but you will always be the shining symbol, proudly calling for light and freedom.